So when we are seeing dinosaur bones in museums around the world, are we seeing the actual bones or are we seeing recreations of the bones? The problem is that the bones are oftentimes really badly mashed and distorted. They can be buried under one to two miles of sediment during the millions of years that they lie in the Earth's crust. And that causes these to basically look like they've been through a Play-Doh roller. They've got, you know, two miles of pressure on them. They literally can get pancake, for lack of a better word. Rob, how did you get interested in dinosaurs? Were you always interested in dinosaurs? Probably like the typical kid, you know, of course, as a child, you're fascinated by it. I had all the books like most kids. And then, you know, as you get to be a teenager, that's no longer your focus. Most people fall out of that. And so during my summers off from college, I ended up finding a dinosaur that was named after me. I used to work out in Moab, Utah during those summers. And so finding that reignited that interest. And I guess in some sense, it was never lost in the respect that I've always been fascinated fascinated with the past and even as a teenager loved to find you know arrowheads and bits of fossil and things like that so in that sense it never went away but the specific interest in dinosaurs got kind of reignited with that discovery in college okay hold on you just ran over a big beat here which is yeah, I, I know. dinosaur named after you i don't think there are many people on the planet that can can you have bragging rights can you what happened? It's a genus, right? It's not a yeah, dinosaur. It's it, a... It, exactly. And so that that was really incredible because, you know, when I found that the paleontologist said, well, you know, we'll, we'll end up naming this after you. And I, I assumed it would be something, a Saurus, Gastoni, or something like that. But actually, the genus was named after me, Gastonia. So in a nutshell, what happened was, you know, on my free time, I would go out prospecting for fossils and looking for things. And so ended up finding bits of an armored dinosaur. And I could see where these bits had rolled down from a ledge on a steep hillside and, you know, kind of followed it up. And when I got to the top of the hill, it was really incredible. There were bones in the rock and pieces of bone weathered out. So I knew I had found a bone bed and was really excited. And so I collected a couple pieces of it. And fast forwarding a couple months later, I was working at a rock shop and we had a piece on display and, and a paleontologist came through. And coincidentally, the paleontologist is Jim Kirkland was studying these types of dinosaurs and he went crazy when he saw that uh, you know where did you find it these are incredibly rare you know this sort of thing so it just took off from there I, I took them out where the location was the museum started an excavation you know years later the publication came out it was named after me and that's also what launched the business I'm in through that discovery I met a lot of paleontologists I met a, a gentleman that was a mold maker and things just kind of started to snowball and ended up doing this occupation and it was perfectly suited for my skills. I've got a degree in fine arts, so a lot of sculpture, welding, things like that. It just well suited to my talents and just went from there. So you would spend your summers in Moab looking for dinosaur bones or what were you going there for? Well, so I knew a gentleman that owned a rock shop and a tour business. So I was just working for him, you know, helping right. with the tours, tending the shop, you know, typical college work. And it was in my time off that I would go look for things. I just found that incredibly fascinating. When you go out in the desert and you're seeing, you know, pieces of petrified wood, pieces of bone, fossil ripple marks, things like that, you're really walking through the ruins of, of an ancient biological world. And, you know, what's really fascinating Fascinating is some of these things we would recognize from our world today. You might find a piece of turtle shell or, you know, a petrified branch that, you know, is easily recognizable. But then you have all these other weird things like dinosaurs and strange fish, things like that, that are not recognizable. So not only are you walking through these ruins, so to speak, but you're really in a way visiting another planet in the sense that it, it's our world, but it isn't our world. It was our world. And so what's the incredible high for me and all that is, is that it's the closest thing you can come to time travel. It's like you're not there, but it's like you're feeling at least some connection with these ancient worlds. Did you know right away it was a dinosaur? 
dinosaur? Yeah, right? yeah. I'm not a paleontologist, and especially at that time, my dinosaur knowledge was not great, but I did know enough to know that I was in beds that the only large vertebrate animals they produce are dinosaurs. And because I could see big pieces of armor, I knew it was an armored dinosaur. Beyond that, I didn't know how rare or how important it was. You know, I was 21 years old. And so finding all that out later was wonderful. But I did know that I had a dinosaur and that it was armored. When you were working at the rock shop, what kind of things would you see people bring into the rock shop? Well, that, that's a really interesting question because, you, you know, as you can imagine, you see everything. You'll get people who are well aware of what fossils are and what they look like, bringing in pieces to sell. And then the funnest part is you get a lot of tourists, you know, Moab's a tourist town. And so people would come in and ask for, oh, you know, where can I find things? Or I've got this thing in my trunk I found. I'm, I'm certain it's a fossil brain or a fossil leg. I mean, they have really no idea what they're looking at. And sometimes it actually might be a piece of bone, but 90% of the time it was just a very bizarrely shaped rock that mm. caught their attention, but it was always fun. You never knew when somebody opened their trunk what was going to be in there. And it was usually something interesting. So when does it go from that to sculpting dinosaurs? Okay, so, you know, I had graduated in fine arts, fast forward a little bit, had a business doing, you know, I did metal art furniture for a few years, and I was always participating in the dig and learning more. And so throughout this whole time, I'm, I'm involved in paleontology, you know, meeting more people in the field, meeting a guy that was a mold maker. And so I started kind of doing that as a sideline, just for fun, just making molds of small fossil pieces and then starting to reconstruct those. And things really started to snowball. People would then start, you know, museums and individuals would start bringing me, oh, well, you know, I've got a piece of a skull. Can you do that? And so then I attempted a full skeletal restoration of the dinosaur I had found, Gastonia, you know, one step after another until, you know, major museums were bringing me skeletons that were new to science. And I was just having the privilege of working on just all these incredible pieces, mostly coming out of Utah, Grand Staircase, Escalante National Monument and places like that. And so, you know, starting about the mid 90s, it just really snowballed. And I've been doing it full time for over 25 years. Now, how do you describe what it is that you're doing? Oh, good question. I say that I restore dinosaur and extinct fossil animal skeletons. I mean, that's a little bit long-winded, but that's what we do. We take them, we restore them, we cast them and mold them. I want to make it clear, we don't really do any restoration on the original pieces. Those, for the sake of science, you don't want to alter them or, or apply any epoxy clays or do anything like that. So we'll get a high-quality plastic cast that's exactly you know, to the dimension and all the details. And then our restoration begins on that. And then from that, we'll construct a full skeleton. So when we are seeing dinosaur bones in museums around the world, are we seeing the actual bones or are we seeing recreations of the bones? It's kind of a long answer, but I'll try and condense it. So probably if you're in a major museum, like the American Museum in New York or the Smithsonian, you're probably seeing mostly original material there. If you're going to a smaller regional museum, well, when I say smaller regional, I don't necessarily mean small, like the Denver Museum or the Utah Museum of Natural History. Even those museums, you'll see quite a bit of cached material on display. And the reason for that is very good. Good. One thing is the economics of dinosaurs. Buying a real dinosaur skeleton is incredibly expensive. They're difficult to come by. And so a lot of smaller museums, you just simply don't have the budget for that. Secondly, from an accuracy standpoint, most of the bones that we get, let's just say, for instance, we have a full skeleton, which we usually don't find. Usually when we get a skeleton, it's only partially complete. That's really not the problem. The problem is that the bones are oftentimes really badly mashed and distorted. They can be buried under one to two miles of sediment during the millions of years that they lie in the Earth's crust. And that causes these to basically look like they've been through a Play-Doh roller. It's what they call plastic deformation, where these bones are eated underground. They've got, you know, two miles of pressure on them. They literally can get pancake, for lack of a better word. And so that's the problem you run into is, so how do you put a skeleton together 
together when, say, one of the vertebra is squished into a pancake. There's no way you can meaningfully articulate that. So that's the other part of the issue is, is even if a museum does have an original skeleton, they often are not suitable to articulate them and put them on display. The public would not really understand. I mean, you'd have a skeleton that's completely nonsensical and disjointed. And then the last bit I'll add to that is from a science standpoint, it's difficult sometimes to mount original pieces, meaning unless they're really well mounted, a lot of times you have to put pins or bolts in the bones, which damages them. And also if researchers want to come in and look at those bones, they're up on a steel armature, maybe 10, 15 feet in the air, and the museum can't obviously take the mount apart. So at that point, the original bones would become inaccessible to researchers. So that's another reason why a lot of times you won't see at least the originals mounted. Hopefully the original bones will be in a case near the skeleton, but sometimes it's not the best idea to mount them. When you're kind of making the mold, how do you make it so that you're not actually destroying further the original fossil? We don't do any of the preparation, meaning the cleaning and stabilization of the bones. So we rely on the museums to do that work. And when you mold something exactly, you don't want to do any permanent damage. And when I say permanent damage, I mean anything that can't be easily repaired. Because you have to remember, when bones are being quarried, they're, you know, you're coring them out of hard rock. They're getting broken. They're coming out in fragments. They're getting put in plaster jackets, hauled back to the museums cleaned more, glued together. So they're already in fragmentary form. And so when we mold things, yeah, you, you can get little pieces breaking, but hopefully that's just, you know, a clean break. You glue it on, no information's lost. What the fear is sometimes is you might get a piece that hasn't been properly stabilized and it breaks and it starts to crumble. That's very rare. We usually take great pains to avoid that. But to your question, it is something you need to be very aware of when you're molding original pieces. And you need to take every precaution not to let that happen. You want to return things basically as they were given to you. When you pull it out of the ground, if it's misshapen or it's been pressurized, how do you understand what to do to pull it back to make it whole again? That's where we really rely on paleontologists. I mean, as an artist, I'm good at visualizing, you know, three-dimensional shapes that have maybe been compressed or distorted. But we want to look at other animals that are closely related to what we're restoring. And there will usually be good uncrushed examples of these skeletons that have been published. And so we'll basically use those as references to make sure that our reconstructions are, are done correctly. And then the second part of actually how we do that is a little complicated. It can be anywhere from if the bone is just horribly mashed, sometimes we'll just have to make a sculpture based on that. But generally what we're able to do is sometimes in cases where it's not too badly mashed, remember Remember, these are plastic pieces we're working with at this point. We can do a little cutting and heating and bending to help out. And then in the worst case scenario, what we've done is actually what I call taxidermy, where we will make a styrofoam form of the bone as we think it is, and we'll pull basically a skin out of the mold. And while that material, before it sets up, while it's flexible, we'll stretch that skin over the styrofoam form the same way a taxidermist works. So we're keeping the original surface of the fossil, but putting it into hopefully its more accurate form. How long does it take? Uh, it can be, if it's just, you know, a piece with slight distortions, we can do that fairly quickly and remold it. Other pieces, if we have to use the, quote, taxidermy method, it can be pretty protracted. That can take a couple days or longer if it's a skull we're working with. And then the whole process of putting a skeleton together can, you know, take one to four years, depending on the amount of material, the, the condition, all of those factors. How many can you do at one time? We always have several projects going in the shop at once. So we're kind of constantly bouncing back and forth between, you know, this skeleton and that skeleton and priority ship, depending on, you know, when the museum wants a piece or maybe they want to publish and have photos of the reconstruction for the publication. So that a lot of times will keep our priorities constantly shifting. Do you have competitors? 
Yeah, they're, I don't consider them competitors in the sense that they're in the last 30 years. I mean, they refer to it as the dinosaur renaissance. There's been lots and lots of dinosaurs discovered. And so there's maybe roughly six companies like mine in North America. And so we're, we're generally working on different animals. And I avoid if somebody offers me a skeleton and I know that another company has, you know, maybe Triceratops, for instance, if I know that one or two other companies have already done Triceratops, I'll probably avoid doing that just because because it's competing, but it's also going to cut my sales down as well. So if I'm getting stuff that's new to science, I'm going to stick with that. And so in that sense, I don't look at it as much of, of competition as just sort of other companies doing the same thing. What kind of people, you know, do you have on your staff? What are the skill sets and how do you all work together to do this? Yeah, so usually people come in and say, oh, well, you need to hire a lot of people, you know, in paleontology. And actually, for what we do, you know, a lot of it, it's just hands-on. So you need artists, people that are good with, you know, clays and putties and welding and forming metal, and then just general tool use. So you basically need a handyman slash artist, you know, people that are really comfortable with those shop skills. And then, like I say, the paleontologists really come in. When we do our work, we may send them a photo and say, hey, you know, hey, how's this looking? Do we need to make any changes or... Is the skeleton in the right pose or things like this? So the paleontologists are very important to what we do. But once we're in the shop, we're reliant on kind of artistic, just, you know, the hands-on stuff. Do you see any of the other people from the other companies? You ever run across them at a museum or a meeting or something? Are there conferences? Like, oh, yeah, 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 exactly. As you can imagine, with you know, specialty interest areas, there are meetings and everybody's usually there, like the Society yeah. of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting. A lot of companies like mine will go as vendors. And so you see all the researchers, a lot of the people that do restorations. And then a, a lot of the people I know actually do life sculptures of dinosaurs. And that's wonderful because it's different than what we do. We're strictly doing skeletons, but it's really exciting to see their work because it's kind of complementary to ours, but again, totally different. Are there some of them that give you the stink eye, like, you know, ooh, you, like competition between yeah, them? Maybe a little, but I, you know, I won't go into any, any name, but I, you know, I'm so happy with what I do and I've always got plenty of work. So it's just like, yeah, whatever, you know, not going to waste any time thinking about it. Now, how do you develop the pose that a dinosaur would make, you know, because I imagine, you know, once you have the bones, you could do it any way you want, you know? Yeah. Generally, the museum that orders the piece has specifications for what they need, either for the diorama they're doing, or it may just simply be space constraints. So it, it has to be more upright because we only have X amount of space. So they usually dictate it. Although, uh, you know, a good percentage of the time, people just say, oh, you know, make it look like the picture on your website. So that's good. I would sometimes love like to have people maybe do stranger poses. In other words, I was just talking to somebody the other day. And so for a meat eater, you know, a theropod dinosaur, people always want it biting, running, jump, you know, some kind of action pose. I think it would be cool to do one nesting, you know, laying down with the arms out. You know, right. nobody ever wants a meat eater laying down, but someday I hope somebody will request, oh yeah, do a tyrannosaurid, but have it sleeping. That would be kind of fun. I mean, like after a big meal, like after yeah, hours yeah, one of, one of my favorite sculptures, I, I traded with a friend of mine who does life sculpture, and I've got a bronze of an allosaurus, and it's an allosaurus sleeping. It's laying down, you know, legs folded up, head up, and I love it because all the other sculptures I have are all exactly what you'd expect, you know, running, biting, you know, and I, I get that, but it's fun to see or do something out of the ordinary. You know, scale, like how do you decide how big or small an, an animal will be? Now that I have no choice. That's dictated by the fossils that we have. So it's always a one-to-one -one version? Absolutely, yeah. You know, what we're doing, the fidelity is exactly to that of the original fossil. I mean, these things don't really even vary by more than a millimeter when we cast a, you know, a given bone. You know, there's some slight shrinkages in materials, but it's, it's imperceptible. So the only time that might come into play, we haven't done so much of this, but, you know, with three 3D printing, somebody might want, you know, a skeleton with babies. And so somebody might request a 3D print for a set of, you know, 12 inch juveniles or, or that sort of thing. We don't really do so much of that, but there may be call for that. What, what you're asking, yeah. 
Now, if you're going to do a T-Rex, I imagine those bones are quite big. I mean, like how big is the animal that you can make? Because imagine those bones are huge, no? Yeah, so there's really no limitations with molding and casting. Our limitations are our shock facility, which is pretty small. So I've tended to avoid big dinosaurs, meaning most everything we do is 30 feet and under which, you know, on a human scale, that's big. But as dinosaurs go, that's medium, large-ish to small. We do a lot of smaller mounts to, you know, dog-sized dinosaurs and things like that. I enjoy doing the smaller stuff, but just our shop facility keeps us from doing, you know, the huge plant eaters like Brontosaurus that were close to 100 feet long. I just just don't have the storage and shop space or or really the inclination. I, those are wonderful, don't get me wrong, but a little beyond my capacity to do. You know, 30 feet is pretty big. So where are you keep, are you just moving those bones around all day long, you know, to make sure you have room to make the next one? Yeah, everything disassembles and it, it goes out right away. I mean, we're no different than any other, you know, whether you'd be restoring cars or boats or whatever, probably once your project is done, the customer's already chomping at the bit to get it. So, you know, it's funny, we work on things for months and months. It's maybe in here 48 hours and then boom, it's gone. And so sometimes you'd like it in the shop a little longer to sit back and look at it and enjoy it. But now it's rarely standing up for more than 24 hours before they they disassemble and then they go into crates and are shipped to, you know, elsewhere in the U.S., Japan, Europe, wherever the customer is. Now, do you ever go visit them wherever they are? Do you ever see them again? In the U.S., I haven't had the good fortune to get to Japan yet, but it's on my list. And I keep hoping somebody will invite me over to install one of our pieces, which is odd because Japan probably accounts for almost the biggest portion of our business. Really? or enough that I we could not be in business without the country of Japan. It seems to be in the national psyche. I, I don't know whether it's, you know, Japanese mythology or what it is, but almost every state museum in Japan has dinosaurs. You know, it's a dinosaur crazy society and they order a lot of dinosaurs. Korea too, but Japan seems to be a hot spot for it. Isn't that true here as well? You know, it is, is, it is, yeah. but I, I think in Japan, it's a little like, well, I'd say extreme in the good sense. I mean, again, literally every state museum has dinosaurs, which if you put that in perspective for the U.S., if you go to, you know, maybe the West Virginia State Museum, I, I'm just making up something, but you may mm -hmm. not see dinosaurs there. You may see more things related to the history of West Virginia. It, it wouldn't right. be a place that you would expect to see dinosaurs, but not true of Japan. You can go to any of the prefectures museums or every prefecture will have a dinosaur museum. And so it's just a little bit beyond, you know, we love dinosaurs here, but they're another step above us. Do you think we're going to get to a final, we found them all? Or is it, no. we're never going to find them all? How no. How many there were? Well. If, yes, how many were living? I mean, it, well, there's billions, I mean, you know, it's a long time. It's like 250 million years. Yeah, exactly. You've got such a time span of animals. And so, you know, things are buried so deeply, we'll never find them. Some things, I mean, you don't know if something's five feet under the surface. You only know once it starts to weather out. Construction projects are increasing a lot of the discoveries of actually two or three of the dinosaurs that we've done were discovered as a result of construction projects. You know, you never know the dinosaur was there. They're digging eight feet in the ground to put in a foundation and boom, they hit something. So with, you know, expanding human populations, expanding development, that's one reason you're finding more. But conversely, in some areas, you may be finding less because you're getting a lot of poaching and illegal collecting. And so the dinosaur market right now is through the roof. Fossil prices are incredible. So in you know North America, Asia, you're getting a lot of people going out illegally, gathering these things up, selling them on the black market. And then in that sense, they're gone forever. They've disappeared. You know, hopefully some record is made of those, but maybe they'll surface again when the collector dies. Maybe they'll end up in a museum. Who knows? But so a, a lot of crazy things are, are going on, both increased discoveries and stuff out in public lands and wilderness areas kind of getting getting gathered up or disappearing. But to your question, I, I think we'll always be finding more and more stuff you know do you still go on digs you must have met a lot of these paleontologists so do they bring you out every now and again 
Oh, yeah. I'm paleontology digs. People are always welcome. If you ever want to join one, they always need extra hands. I mean, nobody's really paid except the museum staff. And so when you're on a dig, 80% of the people there, you know, there is volunteers, volunteers or students. So you're always welcome to go. As far as me, the sad truth is now running a business, I'm in the shop all the time. And right. so I don't get out as often as I could. But the short answer to your question is I, I try and get out at least a couple times a year and join, you know, one of the museum digs, you know, the people that I've been working with for years and see what they're pulling out of the ground because it's stuff we're probably going to end up working on. And has that happened where you see them pulling something out of the ground and then you've ended up working on it? Has that happened oh. more than once? <laughs> Absolutely, all the time. And is there something you get from seeing it pulled from the ground that helps you in your work? Not really so much. I mean, I need to see it out, cleaned off, prepared, all of that good stuff, other than just the personal rush of seeing those moments of discovery. I mean, you, you can imagine an archaeological site where you're seeing a famous Egyptian piece or something unearthed for the first time. And so if you're there at that excavation and then the piece becomes fairly iconic, you know, that's just so cool to see all those steps of the process. But for accuracy of our restorations, it doesn't play much of a part. Right. You've met a lot of these paleontologists. You know, was there something you could tell us about paleontologists in general, like the people who like to go out and dig for these bones? Well, like any interest, there's a lot of interesting people, a lot of eccentric people. You can imagine, you know, your stereotypes of the scientist who has kind of the, you know, tunnel vision about things, other people that are incredibly diverse and well-rounded. So it's a very interesting field. I mean, you get just a lot of interesting, atypical people with any interest. If you go to maybe a tarantula convention or people that study, you know, any any anything that's out of the public mainstream, you're always finding a lot of, of really cool, interesting people involved in that and made a lot of lifelong friends in the profession. Now, do they sort of look at you a little differently that you have your own genus? Yeah, you know, you instantly are somebody. It's got instant name recognition. Whether you have done anything in the field or not, just that alone is something that makes you somebody in the field. And then for me personally, that's just so cool. I think we all have questions of, you know, our own mortality. You know, what, what do we leave? Does, does anybody notice when we're gone? All of those things. And to know that there is at least some mark that I've left at this point in life, that, that's really wonderful to know that my name will always be associated and recorded with that discovery is, is a really cool feeling. Although, you know, you do work on things that are millions of years old. So, you know, when you talk about time travel and looking into the endless sea of history, you wonder whether anything that we're doing now can last long, you know? Yeah. And to your point, also daily being confronted with things on a geologic level, that makes you feel even more insignificant because, you know, when I'm saying, oh, yeah, my name will be associated. Well, I'm just, you know, looking at it in a historical sense. But to your point, yeah, maybe in two or 300 years, you I mean, we live in such uncertain times with, you know, everything going on, maybe a lot of our records that we consider important will, will be lost. But then at the same time, you're looking at with the dinosaurs, things that, you know, span time that we can't really even conceive of on human terms. Yeah. What, what happens when you go to see Jurassic Park? What do you think when you go see movie a movie where there's dinosaurs in there? Are you like looking at it to see if they're doing it correctly or... Do you not go? Uh, yeah, maybe. I do go see them. I'm, I'm not really into that part. I, I, how do I describe this? I look at dinosaurs the same way I go outside and love to see birds and snakes, where I kind of imagine them in their world doing their thing. I don't get such a thrill trying to imagine them in a human world attacking humans. I, I sadly, I, it's kind of ironic, a quick segue. I, I was doing a show one time and we had our skeleton set up and the public was coming in and almost every man under 50 that came in, their universal comments about the skeletons were how it would need to be killed or how hard it would need to be. Oh, I would have to have this kind of gun to, to kill it. And I thought, well, at first that was kind of amusing, but then it became, I thought, kind of a sad way to relate to magnificent animals as to yeah. what you need to do to kill it. And so I guess in Jurassic Park, I feel it's a little bit of that sensationalism. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. It's cool. It's it's great to bring dinosaurs to the public. The kids love it. I, I think 
think all in all, it's fine. It's a good impact. Just for me personally, I like visualizing these animals in a different way. But one last side note on Jurassic Park, what was personally cool is the one before the, I, I didn't see the last one, but the one before that had a scene where the, you know, the rich guy has this own private museum with all, all the skeletons set up. Most of those were our skeletons that we did. I was going to say, either or, there was the Gastonia, whatever. Right? Yeah, so we, we did almost all the skeletons in his private, you know, mansion museum. So so that I got a kick out, out of that. I can't can't deny. But as far as dinosaurs, you know, biting people's heads off and flipping over cars, I, I prefer to think of them in their own world. You know, I love what you just said, though, their magnificence, you know, so, you know, they do capture the imagination, particularly, I think, for boys, probably more than girls. And I just wonder, you know, going back to the beginning of what you were saying, as a little kid, were you always looking at them, you know, pictures, reading about them? What captured your imagination about them? Yeah, as an artist, it was just the images. Some of the early paleo artists, I just fell in love with those images. A lot of them were inaccurate, but they were just so compelling. There's an old image of the dinosaur Brachiosaurus, which is a huge long neck plant eating dinosaur depicted standing in the bottom of a lake with only its head sticking up and it was just such a haunting crazy image and of course beautifully painted but it was just seeing those images of those worlds that were just so compelling i mean a lot of them looked like african savannas but minus the elephants and rhinos that had triceratops and t-rex so again it's going back to where yeah it's the earth but it isn't really the earth as we know it. It's the earth for all intents and purposes has gone through these stages that would be totally alien to us if we were, you know, shot back 150 million years. <laughs> what does Elisa think about this? Is she a paleontologist, your wife? She isn't, but she is an artist like me. So we work together on the restorations and her skills far surpass mine in sculpting ability. So we, we also do some traveling exhibits and she's been able to do some of the life reconstructions for those, which are a little bit beyond my sculpting abilities. So we complement each other really well with our skills and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, neat, both of us come, come at it from an art standpoint. Did she know you were going to make this foray into dinosaurs when you first met? Or did you did you have to break that to her easy? No, she knew that right away. I was doing this about 15 years before we met. So, um, you know, she, she knew right away. Um, and, and matter of fact, she heard about me through through my work. And so uh, I think she knew that before she even knew me. Nice. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing this about all this work that you do. We really appreciate it. Yeah, well, I really appreciate your interest. Thank you.